Hello and welcome to A Live After Reading. I'm your host, Tim Niederreiter. And with me today is a friend of the podcast, well, uh, a friend of mine personally too, a writer, an actor, just an all-around great guy. Oh, a game master par excellence. Rob Ward, welcome to the podcast. Hey, Tim, thanks for having me on. I'm very happy to be here. Well, it's it's great to have you finally on this show. I mean, we, you, you're my old co-host from my old. Well, we were co-hosts on the old show, uh, and it's it's great to finally be podcast with you again after a fairly long chunk of time. It has I been a couple of years, right? Yeah, yeah. We didn't. We haven't podcasted together since the pandemic started. Since before yeah. the pandemic, yeah. So that's that's been a while. <laughs> the world has changed. It's been a hot minute. <laughs> <laughs> Hell yeah. Uh, so Rob. In the meantime, you have uh, developed uh, a, a, a new skill, we'll say, that goes to your acting and gaming and all that stuff. You are an author now. I am, yes. I have just published my first book, Click, um, back in April. And, yeah, it's um, it was one of those pandemic projects where you get... Um, well, I should essentially tell how it started. Um, I was gaming a lot over the pandemic uh, you were there tim and you were the one that <laughs> yep. said like hey this idea that you have for a game it might work better as a book why don't you mm. just write that book and i was like well it ain't like i'm doing anything else so <laughs> <laughs> i guess i could pick up a new skill and do something yeah. artful yeah I mean, uh you know it took a good nine months to write it out um and then i had knee surgery and i thought oh i was gonna get it all edited and all that but <laughs> um i was in too much pain and when you're hopped up on uh on uh oxycodone you mm. tend not to want to do much so it took me a while to get back into editing that took another nine months and bada bing bada boom out comes the book <laughs> yeah and it's a fun book i gotta say having read it or read early versions of it and the final version. I gotta say, I really enjoy it. I think you and and that's this is a very different interview than we usually do because usually the show is about me meeting someone for the first time or meeting a guest who I I'm because I have so many guests now I don't have time to read most of their work but of course we're buddies so I read yours and I love it and you've got this really great thing you do with characterization where I don't it's just it's got to be the the just your natural skill as a that you brought over from the acting world honestly because. These characters, they just they just come off as so vivid and, and exciting and vibrant. The, even the small ones, they make perfect sense. And that you don't have to describe them all that much. You don't have to get into this into the clunky details, you know? So just a compliment there. I don't know if there's a question in that. <laughs> well, I, I really appreciate that. Thank you. Um, but I do believe that does come from my long, long tenure in the world of theater. Because... A lot of time, when you get a script, it's just all dialogue and some stage directions. Yep. So from that, it's up to you as the actor and the director to guide you in how these characters inhabit that text, how they would deliver a certain text. And I, I really think my, also my experience as a game master, mm -hmm. uh, being like, okay, what is this character like? What happens if they're in this situation? I, I, I guess I'm very character-based is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, definitely. I, I'd agree with that. I, and, I mean, from from the small characters to the important characters, there's a lot of just, you know, just compelling moments there. So, I, I don't know. I I, I don't want to... I'm going to get, get, get that taste out of my mouth in a second here. Okay. So, um... <laughs> Uh, that, okay, that's better. Um, so, Rob, you were, yeah. you, obviously I know a bunch about your, the process where you wrote this book because it kind of helped you along with it. But uh, on, on occasion, obviously, all the credit to you. But uh, I got to say, I do remember a certain amount of, uh, I don't know, hesitancy in the past maybe? From or hesitancy from a lot of people I know because I, I you're one of the first people I know who I was kind of because I, I always I mean most of my friends are authors now mm -hmm. and most of my or at least writers and uh, I always I feel like I feel like in hindsight that I've frequently been t saying you know maybe you should try it you know you should try writing something <laughs> to like everybody I know at some point 
And and you're one of the first people to take me up on I it. Do that to uh, pretty much everyone. <laughs> yes, I do. I do. And eventually it takes. It eventually it goes, and we get someone like you who takes the plunge. And uh, I thought that was. I don't know. I'm not again. I don't know if there's a question there. I'm not doing a great interview subject here because this isn't an interview well, no, show. I, mean, I, I think it's a. It's a very uh, important thing to identify because a lot of people. Um, well, immediately after I wrote uh, Click, um, or even before I, I just announced it that, hey, it's coming out soon, mm-hmm. uh, like a couple of people have reached out to me like, hey, I'm also writing something, or I had this idea in my head, and unfortunately, uh, you know, they asked for feedback on their work, oh, yeah. and I come from the world of theater where you really can't uh, sugarcoat much. Yes. Um, and not not saying that you're you're a dick, you know. No. But there is a very, yeah, I do come from a world where it's just like that. What you did there was not effective. You need to change it, or it looked that looked fake, or that looked not as funny. And that that stuff could really um, hurt people, especially with writing, because yeah, it's so personal and it's so you. Um, mm-hmm. You know, this is all my. I mean, granted, I didn't do it alone. I had you and my wife and my best friend all as alpha readers, uh, giving me feedback throughout uh, the process. And I thank all of you for that. That's it's no way. No man does it alone. But you know, I'll, like I'll I'll bring up these suggestions, and then they uh, people get defensive about it. Mm-hmm. And they try to justify why they did it and almost get annoyed at you. And at some point you're like, you know what? Why am I, why am I spending energy on this? <laughs> yeah, no, I hear you. I used to, I and mean, I used to be a member of writing groups before and I've been in a few writing groups since college and they were always just a disaster. I mean, well, except for the one, the first one was fine. And the other two have resulted in me being more and more annoyed with them over time. And one of them barely, I barely got off the ground Partially because there is another side to that. I'm just going to play devil's advocate here because really, not even devil's advocate. This is my experience is that, yeah, you can be, being honest is one thing, but then being brutal is something else. And, you know, it's possible to say this doesn't work without being angry at the author for doing it. And that's one of the writing groups I was in was genuinely the the, the people I was in with seemed pissed off that I'd submitted something, which is weird. Well, that's That's just a very shitty thing because the idea of, you know, getting critiques is to make it better um, yeah and granted i'm i might be talking out of my ass here because this is the first time i wrote a book um or wrote mm-hmm. anything of this kind of substantial level i've written a couple of sh- uh, plays before but uh you know a, it's much different with a book because there is again you know a way to give uh feedback that's very effective not um very poignant and then there's another way where you just go like, yeah, this part sucked. Yeah. I, I think the line that... It, it just makes the... It, it grows an animosity uh, yes. between you and your uh, critic. And where the critic said like, all right, um, I had a problem with this thing because A, B, C, and D. Um, because in other parts of this work, this is very effective. And I felt like this was not as good as that. You know, there's ways to no exactly, yeah. Give it off or not mean. I mean, exactly. Like I had to give you some. I mean, honestly, I feel like I had to kind of give you some tough love to begin with because you had to learn a bunch about actually grammar and stuff and how to how to work with that in fiction originally. (laughs) And and that's and and, hey, I mean, it's that's the nuts and bolts. And yeah, you need it, but it's also not the most important part of writing a book. Um, I mean, in my defense, I did go to public school in Illinois, so. <laughs> <laughs> so throw them under the bus. It's not your fault. Yeah, I'll, I'll throw the Illinois school system under the bus. No, I uh, I, I, I really am. It, it's hard also just as someone that I know I'm not that detail-oriented mm-hmm. um, to really take the time and look at a sentence and be like, all right, is this working? Is this not working? And because, yes, I never really had to deal with that deal with uh, that skill. I yeah. never had to deal with that um, that toolbox before. For me, you know, anything I've written is, uh, you know, dialogue. 
Right. It's just it's a guideline for someone else to read it, basically. Not, which is, I mean, it's true. That's how it works for fiction too. But it's a, it's more d- detailed in some ways to, when you write how someone is supposed to. You know what I mean? Like it's not, but it, because it is the final piece instead of the thing that the uh, that the actor or the director is going to turn into the final piece, like in a theater. Yes, um, and I, I I agree with that because um, also with dialogue, grammar doesn't particularly matter as much. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because I mean, you're talking to me right now. I'm not exactly Mr. Um, uh, articulate. Yeah, I'm not Mr. Articulate. I I sound like some goon some t- most of the time. Um, <laughs> that's just because you grew up in Illinois. <laughs> well, that that too. I mean, that's probably the Jersey sorry, thing. Uh, Jersey too. <laughs> yeah, you've, you're from the you're from some areas that that naturally produce a uh, kind of goonish tone. Uh, we do, we do, and it's uh, it, it it really does kind of also impact how I write because of the more straightforwardness. Um, in in my acknowledgments, I thank my uh, high school English teacher because she was the first one that was like, "Hey, Rob, uh, just knowing your kind of likes and stuff, I really think you would like this book." And she hands me a copy of. Charles Bukowski's Tales of Ordinary Men. Mm. And, you know, of course, I, you know, growing up in the uh, 2010s, you know, uh, late 2000s, uh, where there was just a whole bunch of homophobia going around. And, you know, yeah, I, I had an interest in poetry. Mm-hmm. But, you know, you, there's such... You, you say that out loud... And that gives a whole bunch of connotations. And it didn't help I was already a theater kid. Yeah. But, you know, being Charles Bukowski, I was able to take that book and be like, hey, guys, this is a poem. Read this. And it's about a guy, you know, getting drunk and, you know, talking about, like, how his ass just itches. <laughs> and it, he does it in a way that's just so beautiful. And yeah. I, I feel like I've always been very drawn to authors who kind of have that dirty realism or that just very straightforward here is what it is uh vonnegut's another big favorite of mine Mm. um of course bukowski no that makes sense i obviously we have very different tastes when it comes to authors and stuff I i like a good chunk of these of i like uh in the fantasy world obviously i'm a big fan of joe abercrombie and he's kind of like that actually Though he he really does adapt his his style adapts so much to the character he's writing from mm-hmm. that it 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 does it, it's not strictly uh, an affected thing or, or it's not strictly a one you know the same way throughout all the whole novel because these are big you know, fantasy novels you know mm-hmm. but anyway yeah yeah yeah, yeah. I, it it is but I I do see like I think that's why I never really got into fantasy before mm, yeah um I. Was it, well, I mean, for a long time, I didn't read anything that was not nonfiction. Okay. Uh, when I was a kid, I don't. It, I had this weird thing going on where I was just like, <laughs> "Why would I want to read something that's fake?" Um, which is really odd. How I'm a creative, and that was how I started off. <laughs> um, it's yeah, it's funny. I mean, it reminds me a lot of my how I started with music. When I'm like, I don't want to listen to any music. I didn't listen to music until I was like 13, basically. Oh, wow. that's. That's really interesting. That, yeah, and then I and I started writing about the same time. Like I, I started listening to music and I started writing and I, I it basically as soon as I hit puberty, I was like, oh, I guess I like this stuff. And I started and I found some heavy metal and then I got really into it. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of music, I like uh, when I was writing, I I definitely found my groove mm-hmm. um, because I had my system and I know that you everyone's kind of got their own method of when they're writing. What I ended up doing was, and I usually write at night, I would crack open a beer or pour myself a scotch, and I would open up Scrivener, and I would go to YouTube, and I would find uh, type in a Doomer playlist, like Russian Doomer <laughs> playlist. And if you don't know, uh, for the audience that don't know what Doomer playlist is, it's post-punk uh, rock that came out of the... Uh, the Soviet Union, uh, after the Soviet mm-hmm. Union, and it's very kind of mellow, dark. And there's also a thing called Doomer Wave, 
which is very much the same thing. But sometimes they'll take a band that's kind of got that more melancholy sound, like the the Smiths, for example. Or mm. um, I'm gonna put, mispronounce his name, uh, Depeche Mode. Depeche Mode, I think is how Depeche you say Mode, that. Depeche Mode, yeah. They take one of their songs and they would slow it down, and it's uh. very almost haunting. And for some reason, that just got me going. Um, oh. So when I I would I turn on a Doomer playlist, I'd and if you read the book, it's kind of got a Doomer feel to it. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Up my drink, yeah. and then I'd write. I'd keep a my phone. I'd I'd set my phone alarm for an hour, and usually I'd hit that, and then I'd go thirty minutes more. Yeah, that's what we like to hear. I was, I was in the I was in the I was in the group, um, and that was really satisfying, and very. Um, it felt really good to get into that zone and it felt really awesome to finally accomplish something that a lot of people talk about but they don't do and i wrote and published a book which is i'm it's still kind of surreal <laughs> oh it gets easier i i bet it does i mean you you're you how many books have you written i've written like 30 or 40 i don't know now but All right, yeah. I, I've only published like fifteen. Still, but you're like uh, Isaac Asimov compared to me. I'm I'm like Harper Lee. <laughs> eh, you know, you got other things you're doing. Obviously, you still act. You still uh, you you appear on stages, as I've seen just a couple times this past year or so. But yeah, other just, people you see you more often. Mine. Huh? You just came to a show of mine not too long ago. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, that Minnesota Fringe. It was good. Good times. Um, yeah. so I want to ask you, are you working on anything right now? Or any new fiction? I mean, um, I've had a couple of things in the cooker, uh, hmm. that I, I'm still playing around with. I don't know what to do with some things. Uh, my, the big thing I'm working on right now is uh, actually a play. Um, it's a one man show about the, uh, about the last moments of a gangster named Anthony Mira. He was a real person. Mm. Um, had this reputation of just being a despicable human being. And I wanted to explore just his last minutes on Earth, um, kind of coming to terms with his past, his interactions with people. Why is he all alone at this time? Uh, yeah, so that's my... I'm calling it Anthony's Last Ride. And wow, have, it's an interesting concept. Yeah, I mean, granted, it's it's very, very... It's not even hatched out of the egg. It's still, okay. it's still underneath the chicken, so to speak. <laughs> it's nowhere near ready. I just started working on it a couple of days ago. Oh, that's what I asked you about, so that's awesome. That's a good. That sounds like a really cool idea. Especially, I, I, there's something about the, the end... Of like, of a life, and picking a real person's life is very interesting too as a decision. I mean, I think that makes so much sense. Instead of making somewhat one up, it's right. well, it's intriguing. Yeah. Since you read Click, I mean, you know, and you've known me. I'm I'm huge into organized crime history. I'm yep. really big into like gangsters and all that sort of criminal foolery. I mean, the book is about. Uh, click for the audience. Um, the the book is about smugglers uh, mm-hmm. going through a war zone, and it's also not to. I don't want to be one of these authors that gets all like metaphysical on myself or just philosophical about <laughs> my own work. But it re- it really does like when I wrote the book. Uh, even though there are, it's inhabited by animal human hybrids. Uh, called gibrids. It's uh, taken from the Russian term gibridi, which means hybrid. Um, so it's a hard G for those wondering how to pronounce it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go on. But I, I do feel like uh, Naya's uh, species is one of more privilege. Mm. And granted, when I was right before uh, I started writing Click, um, you know, that's when we had the uh, the uprising here in Minneapolis after George Floyd was murdered. Yeah. Um, and so it was just very much as 
someone kind of watching horror around you. Um, and I come from a place of privilege. It, it, I, I was just like, how do I explore certain topics that I've always wanted to touch on without trying, di like, diminishing someone else's role in that? And that's just like, well, the only thing I could really do is talk about it through a point of privilege. And I am privileged. And Yeah. Yeah, so I, I think, like, this was kind of a... The, writing this book was also a little therapeutic for me. Oh, I find that writing most books are actually quite therapeutic for me. Most of the books I finish anyway, react. Or I get them done because there's some part of me that needs to see that book exist at that time. Uh, usually that's why I stick with a project. And I didn't know that until I just said it. That's how that kind of works with books too. You know, I mean, I've thought about how, what, what it takes for me to stick with a novel for a long time. And Finishing a novel isn't for me. is not a problem of necessarily time commit. It's it's, a, it's not a problem of how do I do it. It's how long can I stay interested in it. It it, it really is um, a hard thing sometimes. Where I mean, it took me a while to get back to editing quick because I spent a good nine months just writing the thing, mm -hmm. and then I was like, "All right, I'm gonna set it down for a while." And it was almost like uh, kind of pulling teeth for me to just get back into it. So um, I actually did NaNoWriMo on a totally different project before I got back into writing mode again mm -hmm. so I could edit the book. Uh, <laughs> it, 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 but once I was back there, I was like, all right, this is very satisfying again. And it's very... It's it's a weird feeling, like just what drives you to finish a story and what drives yeah. you to live amongst your characters and your world for so long. Yeah. You know, the more I think about it, the more – because I've been struggling with my books lately. I mean, I honestly have not produced a book this year, really. I, I Maybe the one came out earlier this year, but I don't think I've actually published anything new since January. Um might be wrong about that. Maybe February, but it's still, it's a pretty depressing place to be when I can sit. I consider myself a writer. That's and an authorship is my main job, but I am so behind that it's. It, it, I've become rusty at writing. Let me put it that way. I feel like even though I have written maybe fifty, sixty thousand words every quarter, that's basically nothing for me at this point. I mean, that's I don't. I'm not. It's not a boast. That's like a, I didn't put enough time in. I should have put a lot more time in. You know, that's a, that's my me falling flat. Because none of those books are done. Uh, and it's hard to deal with, but it's, I think you'd be, I think, because the way you described when you were writing Click, you know, you just, you crack open a beer or whatever, you sit down, you put your playlist on. That sounds really good to me. And honestly, I don't, my process, I don't mean like I would crack open a beer. I'm not, I'd fall asleep if I cracked open a beer and drank it before I started <laughs> writing. But I, there's something to the just kind of, I don't know if I would say innocence, but kind of, simpleness simplicity of just go for it this is the first try nothing none of this matters that much in the sense of you know until it's done it's not a thing until you've finished a book you're just a guy writing writing a story and then and then when you've written 40 books you become the guy who writes stories and now you the thing you have to keep doing is write stories i don't know right yeah, no, and that's a little more difficult for me than because I remember what it was like for me when I first wrote, it, wrote my first book. I remember bits of it because I was fourteen at the time when I when I finished it. But it was a lot like what you described, obviously. Again, sans alcohol. Um, right. Yeah, and I, I well, I hope you weren't drinking beer at fourteen. I never did. I never I did. Uh, <laughs> I'm not judging. Anyway, but I, <laughs> I, I, I think that's so interesting because me as a much greener author and you as someone that's been doing this for all of your adult life mm -hmm. um, it's we have very different goals in mind and we have very different uh, things we feel like we need to get out of ourselves because I felt like I just need my story out there that's just what I wanted yeah um, that's why I went for self publishing that's like this I, I just find it really cool that people have bought my book and because my wife uh, grew up in the UK 
there's a couple of copies uh, in the UK, and actually there's one in Germany, because she has mm. a friend that lives in Switzerland <laughs> that bought the book. Nice. Yeah, so no, that's it, awesome. That's yeah. Cool to me. That's Spread cool around. Me. Yeah. yeah, there's physical copies of my book um, on two continents. And <laughs> that to me is very cool. Whereas you, I know that this is... Um, this is what you spend most of your time on. This is what you... Well, it should be. <laughs> That's yeah. what I wanted to do. You know, it's what I always wanted. And then I and then I just kind of blew it off for a while now. Just the last few months, really. But, yeah. I mean, I've, <sighs> I've hit a similar snag in acting uh, several times. Huh. I mean, I'm kind of in a snag right now because, I mean, I'm just going back to, like, take some classes right now. Mm. But it's very much that feast and famine... And it's it's very hard on the famine when the famine comes from the inside. And it's not just... No one's buying books, because, I mean, everyone's buying books at some point. Yeah, and the people... It's not that the books aren't going... And, and actually, my books moved a fair amount during these months, even though I haven't been pl- publishing anything. And that, again, no boast. I've Just for me, they haven't been doing any worse than before. But now, I'm like, I need to put out more stuff and... Otherwise, I, they're not doing a lot. They're doing what they normally do, you know. And that's, and you know, that's kind of great, though, that you're, you know, you're having some economic success there. Well, I wouldn't put it that way. Let me put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, Rob, we got a little heavy here at the end, but it's been interesting. I and mean, it's been a good chat. So tell people again where they can find Click. And, yeah, thanks for being on the show. It's been great. Absolutely. Uh, you can find my book Click on Amazon.com if you want a hard copy or an ebook, or you can go on Apple Books, uh, Barnes and Nobles. Uh, both of those have ebook versions. Uh, there's several other vendors across sea that have the ebooks. Um, so if you're in France listening to this, I bet there's some way you can get it. But I sure uh, hope there's someone in France listening to this. That'd be awesome. Uh, if so, uh, uh, bonjour. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but awesome. if you want to also see what I'm up to as far as uh, Click, or if you're inter- if you're in the Minneapolis area and interested in my acting work or my theater work, you can visit me at robwardcreative.com. That's R-O-B-W-A-R-D creative.com. Nice. Awesome. Thank you so much, Rob. And as for this podcast, you can find us at mentalsellerpublications.com. You can find, or timneitherwriter.com. And you can find all my books on Amazon.com. You can also get the hard copies anywhere fine print-on-demand books are available. Thanks for listening, everybody. Talk to you next week. And stay safe out there, people. It's a rough world. But take it easy. Bye-bye.